This is Boxing Tickets NI in association with SB Sports and Chaco. We are delighted to be joined once again with the main man, the legend himself, Wayne the Pocket Rocket McCulloch. How are you, Wayne? You always call me legend, why? I'm old. I'm old, but I suppose Elvis Presley was a legend too. <laughs> and, and obviously the age. Wait, I guess obviously the first thing we can notice, you're in the gym, but probably more significant that you're in the gym you're you're obviously well kitted out in our gear as well. Oh yeah, I've got this. this somebody sent me this. I don't know who it was, but they sent me this. It definitely takes ten years off you. Anybody wants these, you know what? They're worth a nice gift for Christmas. Good material. It fits perfect. And um buy some. Definitely. There we go. That's SB Sports. That's him in the inbox now you saying thanks very much for that. Um we obviously had you on before, and it, I guess a good thing for people tuning in, don't worry, it's not an hour and 45 minutes this time, so um, they, they obviously are not going to be, have, have have your pleasure for too much today, we, we just sort of wanted to touch, touch on a few subjects, um, we're probably what, just, just under a week now, well, for, for us in the UK, it's nearly a week, but we're a week out now from obviously Jay's, Jay Quigley's fight last week against Bobo Andrada. Um, have you sort of had time to sort of reflect on the fight and you know I guess with anything when when you don't win or even when you do win there's always room for improvement um, what was your thoughts and obviously the fight from obviously you were right in the corner as well so you had the best view in the whole whole arena but has sort of anything changed from watching it back the nothing um, the game plan was already done I was called in wet last well last Wednesday morning. I jumped on a flight that night because I was asked could I go up. I talked to Jason. And Jason was like, "It's probably too late to have you up," but I said, "For you, I'll do anything." My friend, first and foremost, and just like the last time when I jumped in a week before, I jumped on a flight, got there Thursday morning, went straight to the Wayans at nine o'clock in the morning, their hotel, and then um, the flight was Friday, so it was there was no there was no time to do anything because. I'd say that I'd studied Andretti like two months previous and I had notes and stuff, but I wasn't part of the team. So, you know, I didn't, nobody asked me for anything. But as I say, I didn't, when I got there, it was too late to say, do this, do that. And the game plan was already done. And I say, I think, you know, I talked to Andy, we were sort of like maybe on the same page a little bit, but certain things that he could have did, but you can't teach somebody that the day before a fight and, and drill it because. Yep, that's why you have training camps to drill, 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 drill. And to say, you know, Andretti's a like a great, a great fighter, nobody, will, nobody fights him. Mm-hmm. And they the fight, you know, you get caught in the first round, you know, you stand up up straight and you get caught. And that's just the way it is. It's boxing. Especially at the at that world level, it's like, you know, tit for tat, no one mistake, boom, you could be beat. And to say, I think the, the second round when he get dropped again, I think good, it was a good referee. The referees, you know, dad did my fights back in the day. But um, I think he did stop a little bit early because I'm not saying anything would have changed in the fight, but the bell was coming up. There was five seconds ago or 10 seconds or something. And so he would have got up. It's got, he's got the next minute to, you know, for me to say something to him. But he didn't get that minute. And I say that's, the referee said, you, you live to fight another day. And the referee, they come in the dress room and stuff, you know, and it was nice about it, but it wasn't, you wouldn't say it was an early stop at your river or it was too late, but give me that minute. I always say, give it that five seconds or whatever to go down there at the bell or 10 seconds, whatever it was, but it was close to the end. If you have about one minute, he's been known in the fight. I don't know, maybe anything, anything. I'm not saying that something would have happened, mm-hmm. but I would have told Jason to keep his hands up high, sit down your punches a little bit, and make Andretti move to his left. But and I was yelling out in the corner. You probably heard me in the corner after the first. Make him move to his left, move to his left, because that way he can't get the right hook on. But but that was the drill that had to be done in, in camp. And, and say, I'm, I was just honoured to be there for him. And say, win, lose, or draw. The first thing I was his friend, and, and say, you know, so if I get if I, all the blame goes on the trainer, then I'll take it. Blame, I don't care. Mm. You know, it's it's one of them things, I guess. Like, 
I guess for anybody sort of community fight week, they, everybody assumed that, that obviously Andy Lee was going to be there. Um, I think I'd sort of I think I'd sort of said the other day that I probably had more hopes of Jay winning when Andy Lee was in the corner. And it wasn't any discredit to you, it was because the drills and everything were there, everything was meticulous throughout. Whereas when obviously you were brought in the last second, it's how much did you know? Um, you know, did you know so much of the game plan that maybe it's gonna be wee tweaks that you would do differently and how that would adjust in the fight? But I was probably surprised more so than Andrada that Normally, like the William Williams fight, he, he seemed to go missing in periods of the fight. And I guess for you, confidence wise, in the corner, you were going, if we can get through the early couple of rounds, and he starts going to sleep and starts, you know, shutting off a wee bit, Matt, then that's when Jager got the work and, and done the damage on him. Yeah, you're right. But at the same time, you have to have the right game plan from the first bell. Because getting through the first couple of rounds it was understandable against Andretti, but but he makes mistakes when he when he's when he's aggressive and, and he makes a lot of mistakes in the first few rounds. And I say Andy's plan made him different from mine that way. But I say I'm not I'm not going I'm not on here to be to say this rather. But I was brought in as his friend. I worked a corner and, and that was the end of the story. Well, my game plan was, you know, nobody knows what it was. Jason, I talked to Jason before the just kind of ring of certain things, but it's too late. And. It's like when I fought, I fought um, Nazim Hamed, Eddie Fudge wasn't in my corner, but he did the game plan. And he said the game plan against the southpaw, who's got a good crack and right hook, make a move to his left, and he's going to look terrible. Well, I say Eddie didn't get the credit for the, the game plan, like, because he was in the corner. Kenny Croom was. But if you look at the fight, Hamed looked like crap. And he couldn't land the big bombs, you know what I mean? But I'm not saying that would have happened in Jason's fight, but I say um, I was just there as a, as a help Andy out and um, help Jason out. And I would just love to be part of the team full time, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's good Ed's in one, you know what I mean? Eddie had his sister, had a, like had a guy called Phil Torrance, Kenny Krim, Freddie at, at the camp when I first came here, and um, Hedgeman Lewis. They were all top 10 prospects in fighting as well. And um, that's the type of camp I came to. Mm -hmm. it wasn't like three assistants, four assistants, and they did. Yeah, I, get, yeah, I guess know. it's it's one of them things. Sometimes you know, you're 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 willing, you're able to help out. You know, you were you're able to pull probably Jason out of a, a massive hole. You know, there was just obviously the second fight in a row. You were able to, to be in his corner, but it, I guess it obviously was proud of you as well. That obviously Jay thinks of you so highly that. Like even when he knows he needs someone at the last moment, he knows he can rely on you. Yeah, we go back to like 2010, 11 ish, and he fought down in Hollywood, California, and, and he fought in the, the World Series amateurs. And I walked the ring that night, and I say we've been friends ever since. When he was based in in, in America, he lived close to where I lived in, in Marina del Rey, and then um, we had coffee once in a while. And I did I trained him a few days before he left. He was going to stay, then he. He didn't stay. The steady was either probably trained with me, he said. But as I say, we were friends. You know, I think friendships are stronger than anything. They, I didn't expect to be up there last week. Mm -hmm. Talking, you're talking Wednesday morning when the fights on Friday night. You know, so I was just hope I was just texting. I've been texting Jason once, like once in a while, saying I hope your preparation went well. Hope this went well. You know, so that's the type of conversation that I was having, and I wasn't expecting, hey, you're going to work a corner. I'm like, but I, I did it. I'm not, because I say, if you're somebody's friend, you do the best thing, and, I'm, and I, I went up there for him. I was just, I went there as a friend, and whatever the future holds for him, and then me, then we'll see. Exactly. And I, I guess that's the one thing, you know, you know, I guess it shows the sort of person that you are, Wayne, that, you know, in in a, in a sport, sometimes it can be fo so fickle that people can pretend to be friends. That you're the person that someone can rely on. They they do the best for them, and they say changing your changing probably your weekend plans of what you would have done, and um, to be there in Jay's corner. And, and I guess the whole dream was obviously the same one in a world title would have been the the icing and the cake. It would have been the perfect weekend for you. But I guess the I know 
Jay's come out since and obviously apologised to people and things like that, but he just has to lick his wounds off and and recover, obviously, with a broken jaw and, and hope that what he's learned from that fight, he can obviously put into practice for the next time. Yeah, well, it's the first thing. As a fighter, you do, you want to apologise. I told him the other day, don't, don't apologise. He said, that's the first thing you want to do. But I said, there's no shame in anything. You're fighting for the champion of the world. But you want you feel like you've let people down, but you haven't. You know, you haven't let people down. You, you, you know, you're fighting for the championship of the world. You're not fighting for some minor belt. You know, the chance of winning is slim in the, and 50-50 in there, or maybe 60-40. So he was a massive underdog, which is ridiculous. But to say, that's boxing. You don't apologize to anybody because you're in there on your own. And as I say, what happens in that ring, you have support behind you, but what happens in the ring is just you and the other guy. And that's just the way it is. It's just an individual sport. And I say, Jason, I've talked to him since, and I've talked to him about, you know, the, right now, I knew his job, and that's the only knew his job was broke, but in, in, the, in, the, in the dress room, he could do, he could still move his jaw a little bit, but I said it could be cracked or something. And people were saying it's not, it's not broke, but the doctor was there, and then the doctor then finally said to go to the hospital. And I have my jaw broke, like the side here, after Zagro to fight. I didn't know it was broke for 10 days after the fight, so I was still chewing food and stuff. But I go to the dentist and he said, yep, you've got two cracked wisdom teeth and it looks like a broken jaw. So I got my jaw wired for like six weeks. <laughs> Couldn't even, I just sucked through a straw. But Jason, he got two plates in his, but didn't get his jaw wired, which is mm. maybe the way to do it. Because mine was 1996, so, um, so 97, 96, 97, whatever. So maybe today they give you plates and no, no wires, but which would be better for me because you can still sort of chew a little bit. But the jaw heals quickly, you know, it heals quickly and, and it doesn't leave a trace of a crack or anything because of the, the calcium in your eye. So it'll heal when you start, when you get, when it's back to normal and you start moving it again, it's almost like you think your jaw is broke because your muscles are all dead. Yeah, like you haven't been but, using them. Off food and chewing gum again, then I come back quickly and say, I fought what well, another one, two, another five championship fights and never get get damaged again. You know what I mean? So the, 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 the heals. Jason's only thirty years old, so he's got time. And I think right now the important thing is, say he's, he's going to have a bit of a vacation now. I talked to him about maybe coming over here. But I think he's going to Europe or something. But you can still you can still train shadow box, hit the bike, work on technical stuff yourself, and keep yourself fit. You have to get the doctor first, of course. But I think that the clearance will come pretty soon because because you, it's your jaw. You can still do box. You're not going to unless you're getting punched up the head or something again, which you're not going to do for twelve weeks at least. Mm -hmm. But maybe you'll be fine, and then you're back on the horse again. And they say thirty years old. He's at that level, and there's 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 certain fights out in that division that he can he can get and win, you know. So we'll see what happens. Definitely, as I say, it's there's no there's no shame in getting getting defeated, and and as long as you learn from it, you know it's it's not a not a loss if you learn from it. Um, as obviously you well know yourself, the the sort of the main sort of thing I, I wanted to do, I guess obviously off the back end of, of Jay's fight. Um, I sort of started doing a bit of analysis. Um, and I, I sort of I went back as far as January 2017 when Carl Frampton obviously lost to Leo Santa Cruz. Um, obviously, I've already shared this online and stuff like that as well. So anybody that's sort of been tuning into social media already see it, seen it. But in 18 world title fights since, and that's including Carl's loss to Leo Santa Cruz, we've only won five. Um, and and if you take two people out of there, we wouldn't have done it. And, and Ryan Burnett and TJ Dahini. Do you, probably you yourself, Wayne, obviously being a been a as we classify as an expert and a legend and everything else. Does it sort of surprise you when you see the figures we have? I guess in, in one token we can say we've had obviously quite a lot of fighters and world title fights over the you know just under five years. But does it sort of surprise you in a way that when you see so so few in the one column for us. 
Well, it's, 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 you know, that's, that's the world level competition. You know, if you look at those, you say, you listed a handful of guys who were world champions from Ireland, a small, small nation. They, they're, they did win fights to win the world championship. So you got to put that out there to say, look how many world champions we had. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? In a certain, in a modern day. So, and then when you fight the, you know, your first defense, second defense or whatever, you know, you're fighting a guy who's hungry. And that's the way it goes. You know, Leah Santa Cruz and, and Colin, I mean, they always had like four time world champion, different weight classes, mm-hmm. legend. This four two. He did get Polaxed by um Tank, but that's that was a step up too far. But if you look at the way he like him and Carl first fight great, second fight great it was, was. And I thought there would have been a third fight, but didn't happen. So the you know, Ryan and stuff, you know, he's injured. But he's just who they fought, you know. DJ, you know, that's the way that's that's it. That's at this level. You know, even I say Muhammad Ali, Joe Fraser won. Fraser wins. Second, third fights, Ali wins. That's what goes. Ken Norton beats Ali in the first fight. Ali beats Norton in two close fights, the second and third fight. That's what happened. That's that's just boxing. It's like right now, I say the as you read out of the our our winning um, record, which is it's lopsided with more losses. But you just gotta look at the fact. In such a small country, we have had the world champions at the same time. I mean, so. mm. Yeah, they, 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 they think of obviously, I guess sometimes it's sort of nitpicking too much, you know. In 2016, Carl Frampton became a two-weight world champion, three three-time champion of the world. 2017, Ryan Burnett became a unified world champion. We well, obviously Katie Taylor in the women's division that five years ago today she made her her professional debut, you know, and what she's a two-weight. Um, undisputed world champion so I guess probably when we look at it we're going we'll look at the opportunities we've had because when obviously you know until probably what 2010 with probably Andy Lee and stuff there as well and and Brian McGee and, and others like that where we're getting drip sort of fed but it seemed to be like 2010 onwards sort of seemed to be a, a new conveyor belt of, of boxers coming through and probably our most active time where we're obviously Irish boxing putting the landscape they say we're a major player in boxing again because there's so many world title fights you know Jay probably got picked for that world title fight not just on his talent but because it's in Boston and and obviously people love the Irish and things like that so we're such a player when it comes to boxing nowadays I guess it only bodes us well for the future yeah we'll say we've always boxing's always been you know Ireland probably best sport, you know what I mean, world champion-wise. You know, we're, we're good at other sports as well, but boxing, look how many champions we've had from Jimmy McLaren, right? We go back to him, Renty, then Cabral, then McGuigan, Dave Boyd, then he, then see, back then, yeah, Eamon Lochran and, and Bram McGee and stuff. People forget about Eamon Lochran, but he was, Eamon was a, a, like five defenses under his belt, WBO belt, and, and he's, a, he's first under the carpet. I say boxing has been a sport that we've always prospered in. And although the the, the record we have at the minute isn't that great winning wise, but but it'll come around again. You know, it comes around in the 90s, say the 90s more or less, you know, Dave Boys at the end of his career. I come on the scene. We had Emo Lockburn and, and, and Steve Steve Collins. Steve's a two-time world champion as well. And people for, sort of put him out of the equation too, but Steve's a great fighter. He, he served his apprenticeship over here mm. and lost fights before he went back home. So, but he served his apprenticeship, you know what I mean? And over here, he, he did that. And Steve is the greatest Irish fighters of all time, but he's not really talked about. I would say Eamon Lagrin too. But he's, he's sort of, but that was the 90s, but now you see the 2000s, up to 2010s. You know, Brian McGee had his little taste of the belt as well. And it was good that he got it because now, they, if you were an interim champion back then, back then you got the belt. But today, the interim champions were all stripped. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not interim, which is good because I'm not saying no brand didn't deserve anything. But he, if you're an interim champion, you're not the champion. But but I'm glad he got the belt in the end. But as I say, and then Andy Lee 
in the modern day and you know Ryan, Ryan and TJ, Carl, you know, all the same same era almost. Yeah. And I see. So it's 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 good that we have all that and we're, we're it's gonna come to two we're in the two thousand twenties to two thousand thirties. And this could be this could be a decade where we don't really get many people. Mm-hmm. You know, we have I say Kitty Taylor, you know, of course she's a legend, of course she's there, she's a, the woman, and that's a new generation that the women coming through. Mm-hmm. She was a champion over and over before the Olympics, nobody knew who she was. World champion European winning belts here, there, and everywhere. And nobody knew, nobody knew. The Olympics put her on the platform, and now she's on the platform, she'll use it. And they say, Kitty's a great person, a hell of a fighter, and um, she should get credit for what she's has done and what she's going to do. Mm. Yeah. It, in, in some respects, you know, probably are we going to see like a sort of drop off as, as you probably probably sort of alluded to already, are we going to see a drop off because quite a few boxers, you know, it seems to be the new era of boxing now where people don't want to go through the the Commonwealth and and Olympic cycles, you know, people seem to I'm not sure if it's sort of a drop off from 2016 when obviously the controversy surrounding McCon and obviously, um, you know, with the, the judging and I think that's still been been aired out and, and the cheating that was going on. But do you think it's going to take a lot of trust with an amateur box and again the the restore people in the Irish sort of setup or what do you think might have to change in some of our amateur boxers to get them the they stay amateur for longer? Well, I think I've talked to you before about the amateur system in 2001, 20 years ago. I was there for the word amateurs, commentating for, for um, I think it was I, or BBC or IT or whatever it was. Um, I, did, I did three training clinics for free, then out of my own pocket. And I did one up north. And I said, you got to train trainers first. Who is train the father, you got to train the trainers. I don't think that went down too well. But you have to train, the trainers have to learn how to teach these guys what you're, what you're taught. Eddie, Eddie taught me. I, I, before I went here, I taught the guys. But when I go to the major leagues, the Premier League, Eddie Fudge, then I can teach you, and I'm not teaching you in a way where I think I'm better than you. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching, I'm going to teach people to make Irish fighters and trainers better. And to say that was all, everybody was on board about, you know, doing me being, whether I'm being the, the coach in 2001, I was, I was going to move back and stuff. And then it goes quiet. And then all of a sudden, years go quiet. And then another year passed. And all of a sudden, there's this high performance. And I'm like, was well, that not sort of my idea? But then I just thought, you know what, it doesn't matter. And I just forgot about it. They forgot about it. You know, then the high performance comes along. The guys are getting paid. And, and then they weren't getting success though. Because uh, it takes a, a tea up the that four year Olympic period for it. Maybe not get this time, but then the next time you probably get some. And that's the way it evolves a little bit. And say the I'm glad it happened then. Still a mess. To, the coaches still need trained. Mm-hmm. A lot of these a lot of these coaches who, who become or former boxers who become coaches, the first thing they do is train everybody the way you fought. Well, that's mistake number one. Could you imagine me training? Wouldn't be a bad thing if we all won, but yeah. come on, we're all different. You know, we're all different. And I say, maybe someday somebody walks into the gym and fights like me. Okay, well, well, you know, there hasn't really anybody who fought like Mike Tyson. So if you train the fight where you train, then mistake number one. A lot of, a lot of the gyms back home were that when I was a kid, even. Amateur gyms, you knew where the kid was from because of the way they fought. Mm-hmm name any names or, or gyms because right away you knew where they were from because that's a mistake but everyone can train the same way you know you might you might be aggressive i might not be a defensive guy or you I might be aggressive you might be a slick counter puncher so if we're all trained the same way we'll all fight the same way and that's part of the problem eddie trained me when i came here riddick bow had a champ award mike mccallum montel griffin who was in the olympics and for the u.s team and 92, all four of his trained or fought exactly different ways. Mm. 
Ready? Didn't change your style, you fixed it, tidied it up, certain things. That's what you do. And people can't understand it. There is a lot of a lot of trainers out there teaching people, but there's not enough teachers. And you know what? The truth is, I'm not, I'm not being big headed. Eddie, Eddie, I told you before Eddie's on my wall here, and he gave me a certificate sign, and I believe I can be a good teacher. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. But to say sometimes to be able to train. Well, I've, I've, I've reached I've reached to the burn burn done to my friend, and I and I told him during the Olympics, because he was getting a lot of crap, I know he was. And I just told him to forget about that, don't listen, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, I would love to be still part of the team. And he's like, oh, you live over here? I say, well, things can change. You know, if I'm still my neighbor, of course nothing happened since it. Mm -hmm. I talked to him, I think I talked to him. When they were at the World Championships, I think they, got, they didn't get anything. And I was talking to Billy Walsh, Billy got two gold and two silver. With the new generation team coming through, but the American team, okay, they've always been talented skill wise. They've got the coaches here and the amateur gyms. That's the difference. And to say, so I'm not saying I'll never be a part of the Irish team, but my name's been in the hat for 20 years. And unfortunately, they've never even considered me. So do you think they, sometimes, like, I know, I, I, I was asking, but, um, I was actually watching an interview with someone else yesterday. Uh, I was thinking Dave, Dave Walsh was obviously being coached. And I think he was saying in, in some other countries, to become a professional coach, you must, nearly as if you're doing like a master's. So I think you have to study for like four years before you can become a coach. Do you, do you think sometimes probably we need to sort of look at the coaching more, you know, um, so that, that the fighters are trained in the right way so we can get the best out of them rather than, making it easy just to do the, the bare minimum to survive? So a lot of these coaches can be conditioned. They're just conditioned coaches. Not boxing trainer or anything. They're just more conditioned about fitness. But fitness is, is part of boxing training. You know, you don't need to be full out doing this, doing that. There's technique, skills. You know, that's the way Nicholas trained us, Nicholas Cruz. And I loved it. But they... That's what I would do, you know. Right now, I have a guy else with. I say I don't really believe in the conditioning part, but the conditioning is part of boxing. You do your road work, do your sales push up stuff like that, do your boxing training. But I have a guy who helps me doing part of the, the condition part. Nothing fancy like all this jumping through hoops and stuff. <laughs> but suddenly, got to help me. I've got an assistant guy who helps me with the boxing part, so I've got my full team, and they do what they they do my technique. And say everybody's different. My fighters I have at the minute are all different. And until we get that part, these trainers got to learn. Oh, okay, you're not going to get you to fight like I did or do this. Or even if they haven't fought before, the ones think he said, "Yeah, you should learn under somebody for a good three to five days. Somebody who's been taught by somebody else. You know, Eddie was taught Eddie Fudge. Today, today the kids don't know who Eddie Fudge is, but that's understandable. But Eddie was taught by somebody, and, and Eddie's the coach that Eddie that taught Eddie was taught by somebody. So it trickled down from the 1800. Mm -hmm. And and now we're into the the modern days, and, and you've got me, and you've got Freddie Roach. That's it from that school. So, but we learned. We learned under, we, we didn't just say, here we go, I'm the coach, Kyle on the shoulder. And as I say, I could talk about being Aaron's coach in the corner for the Olympics, but it's never going to happen because you know what? For some reason or other, somebody always puts a stop to it, mm. and I don't know. I think I could say for their own pockets, but I've talked to the high guys back into twenty years ago. I talk, I've talked to Bernard. I talked to me the other day. All they need to say is, "You're in." They don't have to say to me, "Oh, you need to do a course." Like seriously. Mm. I've been USA boxing certified and for the amateur team as well. I train amateur. My my license things on the wall. I've been doing that for the last six or seven years as well. Professional license for the last 20 years. You know, so that's experience alone. And I say with Eddie's but with Eddie's 
um, certificate on framed on the wall here. Come on. I'm the only one to give it to out of all 20 world champions. So that's, to me, that's a diploma of you graduated from the Eddie Flood School of Boxing. And I say that's, we could talk about this forever, but that's the problem. The problem is guys don't want to learn. And, and like it's, I guess it's the, you know, is it, is it probably going to, is it in the back of the comfort sort of, you know, I guess, is it a sort of double-edged sword sometimes as well? It, unless you're really fighting at the highest level, you're probably not earning as, as much from the sport, you know. Um, we could probably, there's so many different paths and avenues you could sort of go down is probably what could be causing it. But, you know, I, I know some fighters, you know, I know John, John O'Carroll, obviously, responded back there post last week and, and said that he believes that obviously a lot of our fighters need to get out of the comfort zones of their, their own homes and close to their own homes and get out to America and do some sparring because in every sort of gym there's world champions. You know, you can go to any gym and, and pick up good training. Is that what we've sort of fallen down on? That we don't have enough world-class gyms to go to in the UK and Ireland for boxers to prepare to be the best? Well, I'm fair play to Jono for doing saying that because he's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say he's right, but... Then people are going to say, we my colleague doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, that's fine. I don't care because Jono said it, I said it. I've said it, I've said it numerous cases. I said years ago, people just need to come over and get a bit of different sparring. When I mean different, over back home, you're going to sort of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland and Ireland. Sort of same style, you know I mean? same stand ups. We're over here. My first day in Vegas, I had my pro debut in California. And then I, I flew to Vegas and met up here with Eddie. And then um, that week I'm, th I'm thrown in a ring with a guy called Eddie Cook, who was a bantamweight champion of the world. A little southpaw black kid who, who could knock your hair off your shoulders. And I, I did sparring with him for months. While I, on them months I was getting, I was fighting, I, told, I had my first seven fights in 15, 16 weeks. So I was training, fighting, training, fighting, training, fighting, and I trained with him. And Eddie Cook learned me a lot. And he was trying to rip my head off some days. <laughs> my lip made him busted one day in my nose, but I always held my own. But I was getting better. And then the last day I, I, I sparred him, I hit him with my right hand and dropped him. And Eddie, Eddie Cook of the day, he was he, he respect, he got respect. You know I mean? And he and he was a good great guy, great father back in the day. But that's the type of thing I was learning. I was learning. And I never like I I trained in Barney's with Jim. Barney was was um Grateful enough to let me train there, and I, I'm thankful for him as well. My brother trained there, and as a kid, 15, 16, which you weren't allowed to do back in the day, I get to spar with Dave McCauley, Fidel Bassett, who beat McCauley, and Paul Hackinson, WBC featherweight champion. So I'm thankful for that, and I get to see a little bit of different style when I spar with Fidel Bassett. He's a Colombian, mm -hmm. and I'm this, but I said that was only for a little period. Fidel was out to fight Dave Boy, so. After that, I didn't really. Uh, Dave Boy and Paul Huggins had sort of similar European styles. So, but I tasted a little bit of what I was going to get when I came here. I didn't know back then, as a 15 year old, I was going to be living here. And then I come here and get all this different training. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm saying the farm was harder. Mm -hmm. The farm was definitely harder. And, but it, benef it was a benefit to me. And Jano is right. I'm not saying you have to live here, but have your training camps here. Your training camp five or six weeks. It's not much to sacrifice. And um, have your camps here, get the best spawn, and then go back and you're going to fight in England or Ireland. You're ready for it. But the sailor people are going to say, well, I've did over here, I've did this and did that. Well, okay, well, it's fine. It'll work for you. The, the, the truth is, all time grits. In this country here, how many has there been? One, two, three, four. Um, start counting off your hands. There's been thousands, probably, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, look at it. A platform of what they've achieved here. Bigger nation, but still, boxing is a big main sport here. I guess it's one of them you sort of put down to at times, you know. You look look at, obviously, some of the some of the fighters we've obviously had recently have fought for world titles. So they've fought all over the world as an amateur, but I guess sometimes they can fall into that trap of, because they've done it all as an amateur, amateur boxing, the pro boxing is completely different. So where they box all over the world as an amateur, 
if they're not boxing all over the world and learning skills in different countries and different camps, then they're falling themselves behind. So I'm probably in some ways, fighters probably need to realise that just because they've done it as an amateur doesn't mean they say they're going to do it as a pro. Yeah, amateur boxing, amateur boxing. You know, three rounds. And you, it's does, it does benefit you a little bit fighting different countries, like Cuba, you know, Europeans, Americans, and see, I got to do that. I got to travel. I fought in America probably against the American team at least 10 times, and I never lost. And I say I fought the Cubans. I fought um, Eastern Europeans, and they're all different styles. So it does, but it's still amateur boxing. You know, they, they're... Pinpoint shots, one or two shots, and move, one or two shots, move. And as I say, with Nicholas Cruz Hernandez as our coach from 88, sensational. And, and now he's not even on the, on the, not even involved, which puzzles me every day. But as I say, there's more politics than there is worrying about the fighters. And the fighters, as I still would say, the first and foremost, when I when I work when I work at corner Jason, when I work at corner corner of any of my fighters, I'm a coach, I'm their coach. And, and I understand with the Jason fight, the Irish media there and you're getting interviewed, I'll do the interviews. But I would say Jason's the, the first and foremost, he's the, the first and foremost thing right here. Mm. It's about him. And there's a lot of you you stated the it's early on there that. It's about the coaches, not about the fighter. But I try. I'm the one who tries to stay away and, and be in the. It's it's your time. fighters fighting. Do, do your interview. You don't need me there. If you want me there? I'll sit there with you. But I you don't need me there. And with Jason last week, he did the pre-fight interviews with his own people, and he was in the room. I wasn't. There. I stayed outside, and they would call me, and I'm like, fine. I was talking to some Irish fans, just standing there talking. I don't need to be in the interview. I'm not fighting. So. That's the way it should be with, with the coach. The coach is there. And with me and Eddie, Eddie to me, but like when people knew, I'm like, he's my coach. And like, hey, I said, he fuzzy's my coach. You know what I mean? That's the way I was. Yeah. And it started to be like that with me, but, but still about Damon's. When, I, when Eddie come along, it's like, yeah, he, Eddie's my coach. And when people seen Eddie, the fighters would get a little bit intimidated by him, mm. which I would love fighters to be intimidated by me in the corner. He's trained by him. And people like Freddie Roach, a certain thing have the same thing as well. And but they're always in the sidelines. These are the coaches up front taking the camera like this right up here. And not about that. I'm a fighter first and foremost, but now I'm a coach. So it's about you. And as I say, I'll do my best. I'll give my fighter 100 percent of what I have. And I guess that's a good way to be because at the end of the day, you've you've had your moment, you've had, you know, but it's all now about the fighter and getting the best out of them. And like people can only ask you so many questions before they start asking you what's your game plan, you know, which you're not going to give away pre-fight. Um, or you're never going to give away your game plan to the degree because you're then giving somebody else your method and, and how you do things. So then, you know, probably one prime example, probably Joe Gallagher, who's obviously come up with a lot of amateur boxers and the pro box and you know and people know people then figured out Joe's style Joe yeah. for the first six rounds of the fight was having this fighter sort of not going for it working it out and fighters were able to get themselves a good head of steam before um, the second half of the fight and they were well ahead Frampton probably was a, a big example of against Scott Craig he was so far ahead after six rounds that he didn't have to go chasing the second half of the fight. No, that's the way it is. When you, the game plan, you don't give the game plan away. And I get a lot of, a lot of these, um, you know, the pre-fight meetings and they're like, so what's your game plan? Oh, wait, there is. But let me sit down and tell you the whole game plan. You're not going to do that because the game plan is drilled over and over and over and over and over and over. Plan A, plan B, plan C. Hopefully A works. A doesn't work, you have B. If B doesn't work, you have C. If C doesn't work, you're, you're, you're screwed. But it usually does work. But you win that fight in the round, you tell the guy what to do. You know, that's your game plan. You don't tell anybody what the game plan is. Mm. You drill it and then you're yelling, you're yelling, do this, do that, do that. And, and they've got the voice in their head, they can hear your voice because they're used to it. 
But you have to have the, the, the game plan for the, the win, A, B, and C. After that, if you have, if you have, if you get, if you have, A, B, C doesn't work, then we're in trouble. <laughs> use the head. <laughs> if all else fails, just use the head. <laughs> Good <Get> headed. <laughs> the um, obviously with them. You know, sort of going away from it. I, I know I'd promised I wasn't going to keep you too long and stuff today, but sort of looking yeah, ahead. Kind of work like, looking ahead, obviously, tomorrow night, we've obviously um, probably the closest we're going to get to another undisputed fight in, in Lopez and Cambosa Jr. Is it a sort of a, a sort of fight that sort of gets you going, or is it more the fact that it's a new age type of boxer that it's Sometimes I guess people might look at Lopez and go, he beat Lomachenko when he was injured and things like that. How do you sort of see see the fight going this weekend? I don't really know much, much of a Gambosa, but I'm a, a Lopez fan. I think, you know, for the sake, you know, Lomachenko was injured and stuff like that. That's, you know what, if you're injured, if you're injured in a fight, with most most fighters are, have some sort of injury in a fight, it's normal. You know, if, you, if you're healthy, you think there's some wrong with you. But don't use that against somebody who just beat you. You know, I mean, Lopez is a hell of a fighter. He can fight. He did the right thing against Lomachenko. Lomachenko is a great fighter. But there's certain things you can do to him to beat him, and, and Lopez did that. You know, when I think if they fought again, he could do it again. He's a bigger man as well. And um, I don't like the way they make excuses. Like, oh, yeah, I hurt my, my, hurt my pinky toe. Come on, you know, just... You know, the fight, Lopez, I love the way Lopez fights and I think I can get locker tomorrow. I, I think so myself. You know, Cambosa doesn't seem to have the power that it's probably needed to gain the respect of Lopez and Lopez can probably go to counter right. and sort of wants and decide when he wants to engage and things like that. But he could probably oh, be, right. so, he could be so far ahead by the time we come to the second half of the fight. If we get there that Cambosa is going to have to take chances and obviously when they take some chances he's going to get punished for them. Yeah, that level when you take the chances is when I say the other guy is in control because he's winning. Then the mistakes are made by the guy who's trying to get that, that one big shot and then that's what happens. You bump, good night. And if you're so far ahead like you talked about Frampton being ahead against Spriggy, he didn't need to change, he didn't change anything. But he was in control about why change anything? You know, if Quig would have piled on the pressure and did it something different. Then he had to adjust, but he didn't have to adjust because it wasn't easy. But it was the game plan that worked for him. And why not? Why change it? It was it's still working. Around 6, 7, 8, 9, still working. Why change it? If you change it, then something happens to you. So that's what I mean with Lopez. He's so far ahead. And if he does get a late stoppage or whatever, or a point swing, then if he's so far ahead, he just need to risk um, anything. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm guessing, love obviously, love I'm that guessing probably for yourself, you're probably looking forward to 2022. Um, is, is, is obviously the plan still that Dennis is going to come to America and, and, and join up, obviously, when COVID decides to get lost somewhere? Well, COVID over here, so you, you can travel here, the borders are open. You know, the only thing that happens is is a mask when you're in, inside a restaurant, which I don't know what happened because you, have to, you can take your mask off when you're eating. So what difference does it make? <laughs> yep, you know, exactly. I know that people in my life, my friends, have got COVID really bad. And but as I say, when you're fact and you have the booster, then you shouldn't be able to get COVID to the point where it's almost going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Alan, I just heard last week, fully vaccinated, got the booster, and he was at death's door. People say, if he wouldn't have got the vaccination, he would have been dead. I'm like, well, if you get the vaccination, you don't want to be at death's door either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you should get the symptoms of have a little minor cold or something, but right now, I don't, I don't know. COVID, COVID over here, let's say Vegas is back, back to normal in the last more than six months. You know, they're filling stadium, 65,000 seater football stadium here. Um, the fights have been filled. There's fights here on Saturday. Um, they'll be sold out as well. So people are, they want to put behind them. 
it's still not going to be behind us. It's going to be there, but not the way it was last year. Last year, but you guys had it worse than us, don't we? So, I, I guess the I guess the thing for you, obviously, is you know, it's getting because because De Dennis and him, Dennis in particular is probably coming in the final stages of his of his pro career, and I think he probably you know he's won he's won in that eighteen list that should have been a world champion. You know, it was it was robbed against Mangia. So he should have been another one in that column. I guess okay. it's going to be maybe potentially getting him one more opportunity. They obviously yeah. they, they put a belt around his waist and say I'm now a world champion before he, he hangs him up. Yeah, he should have been a world champion against McGee. But I talked to him the other day, he, he got a win there last week, the other week, and got himself in the draft. And he want he wants to be here, but right now financially he can't. You know, and I say with the COVID over there still a bit strict. But Dennis wants, I would love Dennis to come back here and finish his career because I know I know it's gonna be a champion. And Australia, great, it's a great country. I love it. I've been there. But you're sort of cut off from the whole world, don't we? Mm -hmm. We're come here, then you're established. And Dennis's name, excuse me, his name is already known over here. McGee. And he moved up to fight Charter, which was a step too far up in the weight class. But he's known for his toughness, and um, everybody knows he beat Mungia. And if he can back out one five here, he's, he's back in the picture. He's still the top twenty in the world. So, but he wants to be here. I would love him here, but I understand for now that he can't be here. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a wife and kids. So, but that could that could change. I've been, I say I've been talking to him, and um, we'll see what happens. But Dennis is one of the, these guys who's just hard worker. Nice guy, but can fight. Yeah, and, and obviously Danny Keaton, it, it's it was supposed to be linking up with you as well at, at his first one in Irish soil a few a few weeks ago in the the Colin Boxing Show. Um, I'm seriously seriously impressed with with Danny. I think he went out the first round, um, knocked him down, and then he decided that he just wanted to have a rest and. And enjoy the last few rounds of the fight rather than going for the finish. But really, really impressed me, Danny. And I know he obviously wants to get out and spend some time with you out in Vegas. No, he does want to be out here. I've talked to him the last year and a half. He went back to Ireland to come here, but then he got locked up in Ireland. But I say, no, I, I told him the other last week, I'm not as coach, of course, but the minute for that fight, but I say, you should jab a lot, up that jab, see that left hook to bite. But he, brilliant performance. Got his feet wet again. He's gonna he's gonna fight regular, so you know what I've been as part of the next time possible. It's not saying I'm gonna be, but there's a possibility. If it's a Belfast, I could. And and I guess the I know Paul Keegan's obviously gonna be running the show in in May in, in Dublin, and I sort of don't want to give too much away, but we're probably hoping by that stage we can hopefully get get you over and get get you back and enjoying some Irish boxing <laughs> close by, but. Um, what's the, what's the sort of goals and ambitions you sort of have training wise the next year? You know, are, are you looking to take on many more boxers, and what's the plans yeah, well, you have? No, say I would love to have a bunch of Irish fighters, but I don't care if they're American or whatever. I've got right now, you know, I've got a heavyweight. He's got injured. He's supposed to fight next week, but he's, he can't fight. Um, would have been a big fight too. Wouldn't fight in the number two in the world, but Scott Alexander. When I have a kid over here, Ryan, who's from Australia, five heavyweight, 19 years old. Harry is great grandparents from Dublin. And um, he's been training with me here and loves it. He's going to come back and he's going to be here. He's here for four weeks to spar with Scott's just to feel out what Vegas is like. But I've got him as, um, I've got him a manager Bills. So he's, he's, he loves it here. He's coming back on um, the new year permanently. And I say he's 19, six foot five. Eight amateur fights, so the kid's just pretty. He's pretty raw, but he, he knows what he's doing. He listens. You know, put him a lot of defense in the last couple of weeks, and he's picked it up. And he had to have a lot of defense in that heavyweight division. <laughs> I guess the thing for you is, if, if he's only had eight amateur fights, it's probably less you have to correct. You know, from yeah. someone else or someone. Right, him right. Wrong. You're right, exactly right. And the bad habits, there's really not that many. I'd say just like a clean slate, which is good. And um, so I've got him, he'll still turn pro in the year. 
the heavyweight. I've got um, obviously Danny and of Dennis comes over, and um, we'll see what happens. I mean, they say I've got a bunch of amateurs as well. I I love to work on the amateurs too, like like I'm here as well. So I've got them as well. They they spar with the pros, so I'm doing both. I mean, have the amateurs and the pros. My amateurs, I try to get them to fight like semi pro, mm -hmm. but I don't. Pro, you know what I mean? I can teach. I can teach you semi pro, because amateurs can't go too low. They can't roll too low. You know what I mean? They got to sort of be like like this here. Like that. So I can teach that. I can teach you to be an amateur, but more or less hit a little bit harder as well. And I do that with my my amateurs. I'm gonna say so. We'll see what happens. You know what? I've got this gym here. It's a small private gym, but it's it's got everything you need in it. You know that the ring that ring here has probably had at least. Seven, seven or eight world champions stand that ring. Um, Sparta ring. I told you last month they had Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks sitting in the ring. And Mickey Ward was in there and me were in there. So that's the type of people you have here. And then just in the suburbs of Las Vegas in the neighborhood, and you wouldn't even know the gym here. But got the posters up everywhere. Got a certificate in the wall, there's pictures. So that's all I need. I don't need, I only need a good half a dozen fires because after that, I need 20 hands, <laughs> but I've got an assistant. So I'm, I'm, I've already got my foundation built before I start having the fighters. I mean, that's a good thing. Yeah, People like him. I had, um, I'd obviously put out for questions. I'd, I'd only one question come back. So the, the obviously the likelihood of the person's question was getting answered. Um, the guy, Brett, obviously asked, but obviously with so much of the, and I know we touched on this before, with so much of the, the exhibition sort of type fight back again. Um, would you, you, and I know you spoke about it before and said you'd be open to it, but he wanted to know if you'd like a rematch with Prince Nassim. Do you think, do you think Prince is going to fight him again? Hell no, no. Is it what yeah, weight I, class it would be, I guess? No, I really, that's a good question. I think Hamid, I know he's a lot bigger now, but it doesn't bother me. But me and Hamid doing that would mean something from the 90s sort of era. And if me and him did it again, I guarantee it would sell out all the arenas, Billy would. You know, love to do that. Maybe me and Carl can do it, you know what I mean? For Belfast, I'm the, I'm the generation before him. He's the today's generation. Imagine me, me and Carl did it. I think it'd be good for, good for the fans. You know, the undercard could be a bunch of guys, like six rounders, eight rounders, no smaller fights. And then me and Carl could be like the Apollo Creed and Roger Balboa is coming to the end. To give the fans a little bit of excitement, exhibition, no, no winner like like Tyson and, and Jones. But I think that's something that, that should be done. You know, a promoter, that's a promoter's um, I think a promoter can make a fortune from it. Mm. And I, I guess it gives because a lot of the newer generation probably won't be familiar with, with who you are, obviously, because you know, the new age of boxing it sort of takes over. So it gives people obviously a that may have followed your career for years and maybe not got the, the what you fight is giving yeah. them a, giving them an opportunity to be up close and personal. I think it's not to say the, the Roy Jones Tyson one was a big big hit. You know, I sort of got overboard with the with the Paul brothers and stuff like that. But we're talking about two real fighters doing it like Tyson and um, Roy. Me and Carl are two real fighters, both like champions, and I think. I just think it's a no-brainer. If, if it's not going to be done, I think it's stupid. But it's an exhibition. Nobody wins. And, you know, I think the fans would just go crazy for it. Definitely something to put out there. I'm, I'm sure, obviously, anybody that's got any views on it can can obviously give us a shout and let us know. But I obviously want to thank you once again for, for joining in. It's nearly becoming like a residency now. Um, what are you talking about? I thought I was. I thought I was on the committee. <laughs> well, I say you're 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 part of the resident now. Obviously, you know it was a it was a dream and an honour having you the last time. It it nearly just feels like we're we're best pals sort of now. You know, as I said, get the get the caps. Get, Christmas is coming up, everybody. Come on, you got to get the, these caps. Come on, and these t-shirts. You got to get these. You got to buy them. Definitely. Definitely, if, if Wayne McCulloch's telling me you need to buy something, you need to buy it. Um, but <laughs> you're breaking up there a wee bit, just 
Okay, well, I just want to say thanks again to all the, all the fans and all the you know, the fans of the future of the, the, the fighters I'm going to make world champions. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sure we'll catch up with you, as we always do. I'm sure we'll catch up with you again soon, Wayne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, take it. Take care, mate. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh.